With that being said, uh, the first part of my presentation here is going to be about uh, how do the basic best practices for, for building a startup idea and good startup ideas and, and things that we've learned now in, in the in the almost 12 years of the Founder Institute. And really at the end of the day, if there's one thing that I can impart on you today, right? And this is why I'm putting it at the top, is that if you're going on this journey to build a startup, realize that the cards are stacked against you, okay? There are a million advantages that big businesses have against you. As a startup, there are only two advantages that you have to to go against all of those big businesses all right the first advantage is speed for anybody who's worked in a big company i did for for about for about a year and, and i saw how 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 much that sort of crushed my soul to be honest um but for anybody who's worked in a big company i'm sure you'll see that you know there's bureaucracy right um the the speed at which a big company can learn how to build a product that actually satisfies their customers need is very very slow Whereas in a startup, um, you can move really, really fast. You don't have to go through levels of bureaucracy. Um, so you can really uh, be nimble to the needs of your customer much more quickly. And you have what I like to call a compounded learning curve, right? So it's, uh, forgot, somebody used to say that, uh, you know, it's a very famous quote where compounding interest is like one of the, it's like the ninth wonder of the world, right? It's it's like helped create this whole this whole society that we built. It's the concept of compounding interest. When you're a startup, you can compound your learning, right? Every single week, you can be running experiments, immediately implement the learning from those experiments, and build the next version of your product better and better and better and better. Whereas a large company, the best that they could ever hope for is to have sort of a, a, a gradual learning curve. So that's one advantage that a startup is going to have. So if you're not fast, you're going to lose. The second advantage that a startup can have is their niche focus. Big companies have shareholders, they have, even if they're not public, right? They just have a lot of constituents that they need to report to. So they're never gonna release a product that, could, that targets a niche audience with the perfect, uh, you know, with the perfect product for that audience. They're gonna cast a very wide net. And usually what that means is that they create products that are good for a very large number of people, they're adequate, for a very large number of people, but they're not perfect for any one consumer. They don't create that like, aha, like, oh wow, this is an amazing product for any one consumer. As a startup, you have the ability to focus on a niche, right? You don't have shareholders in the beginning. You don't have anyone to report to necessarily. You can focus in on a very small niche, build, give them a perfect product, and they will be so enthralled by the fact that they have a perfect product because they're used to having all these mass market products from big companies shoved down their throat with advertising and all this kind of stuff, right? If you can give them a perfect product, they'll tell all their friends about that product and then your business can build organically from there. That is how startups are built, right? If they're built on a premise of being able to be fast and focusing on a very small niche in the beginning and then growing that niche out from there and utilizing those network effects and, and the, the fact that their audience uh, that really loves their product is going to share it with all of their friends. So there is one thing that you can do that negates both of these advantages, and that thing is being unfocused. The number one killer of startups. It is not a lack of funding. It is not whatever. It is that they're unfocused, all right? If you only have two advantages and who you're competing against is our big companies and they have a million advantages if you can't even utilize those two advantages you will fail right you will fail and it doesn't mean that you're not thinking big or you're not you know trying to build an, an awesome company it just means in the beginning you have to realize that your two advantages are your ability to go fast and your ability to focus on a small market in the beginning and if you don't use those advantages you will fail uh, before you even get any kind of any kind of traction so being unfocused is actually even worse than being wrong, okay? If you're wrong, if the business that you're trying to build is wrong, but you're focused in, in figuring out that it's wrong, you're gonna learn super quickly. If you're unfocused, you're not gonna learn anything, and you're just gonna be kind of going on and on and on trying to build this business that doesn't make a lot of sense. And this is a term that a lot of people in the startup industry uh, refer to as zombie startups, right? They're walking around, they're, they're still sort of alive, they're still walking around, right? But they're dead. They just don't know it yet. 
<laughs> right? So you don't want to be a zombie. So that's actually the worst thing that can happen to you because that's a great way to burn a lot of money and burn a lot of time, right? Be focused, learn if you're wrong quickly, adjust and try to get closer to being right. All right. So I do realize that just saying, okay, you need to be focused is a broad term and, and maybe it doesn't mean mean very much, right? So let me give you a framework on how your startup idea can be focused. Number one, it has to solve one problem for one customer with one product, one killer feature, and one revenue stream, all right? Anything else is a rookie mistake. And I'm going to go through all of these components now, one by one. All right, so the first thing to understand about startup ideas is that nobody cares about your product, okay? People don't buy products, people buy solutions to problems. That's what people care about, right? Now, I, I do realize I picked a, a funny image here, right? But I would imagine that whoever came up with the picnic pants idea was like, oh, wow, this is such a cool, you know, product, right? But they never thought to go back and think about, okay, what is the actual problem in the mind of a consumer that they have that would compel them to search, find, and purchase my product, right? It's just the way that our brains work. As soon as the startup idea kind of factory starts going on in your brain, you're gonna think about what the product is gonna look like years down the line. Oh, it's gonna do this. It's gonna have all these different features, right? And you're gonna lose sight of actually what the core problem uh, that you're solving for the consumer is, right? You have to solve a problem. We're all freaking busy right? We're not necessarily looking for nifty things that, that add a little bit of value here. We all have problems as humans. We're all looking to solve those problems. You have to focus on a problem that you can solve. And um, customer development, and this is a, obviously a very common term in, in startup land. I believe it was, it was termed by, uh, by a gentleman named uh, Steve Blank, but I, I could be mistaken on that. But it, it's used in Lean Startup Methodology by Eric Reese and, and a lot of the best practices for startups that are out there today. But customer development is essentially the process of finding a problem that's actually worth solving and then understanding that problem so well that you can build a perfect solution, right? So if you go back to what I was saying before, you have to build a perfect solution for a niche audience. And that's what customer development is. And uh, you can Google that. Uh, it's, you'll go down a pretty large rabbit hole there. But it is it is an extremely important thing that you need to do in order to fully understand the problem, the one problem that you're going to be solving for a customer. And that problem in order for the business to be worth solve or for the for the problem to be worth solving, that problem needs to affect a lot of people, right? In other words, it needs to possibly equate to a business that can be sustainable. Um, and number two, it has to, you know, be enough of a problem that those people are willing to pay to solve that problem. All right. There's a lot of problems that I have that are just, you know, just weird little small problems, right? Those problems generally aren't worth solving. You want to find a problem that's that annoys people so much that uh, they'll pay to actually solve it. That's the litmus test, right? If you ask your mother or you ask your cousin or whatever, they're going to say, oh yeah, it's a great idea. But when you really get to the brass tacks, it's saying, will you pay to solve this problem? That's how you know if this is something that's worth building or not. And the first step in salt and figuring out you know, what problem you can solve and validating that problem is in creating a problem statement. So the IdeaFest worksheet, which you can see here, bit.ly slash IdeaFest, this is going to be the first thing. And we're going to, I'll dive into this a little bit more later in this presentation, but this is what we're going to do today here uh, during the networking sessions. Um, but the basic problem statement is I believe that a, a defined audience or has a specific problem. Okay. And an example would be, I believe first time mothers have difficulty buying supplies they need for their children before they run out, right? Or if it's a B2B business, I believe HR executives just see way, way too many applications in the current day. Um, but the first step is to actually start to define the problem that you're trying to solve. And then the second step is to interview those customers. All right. And this is a big component of customer development. And there's a lot of templates that you could find out there to interview customers. This is the one that we like to use sort of right off the bat. Um, simple stuff, right? What's the hardest part about whatever the problem is that they're trying to solve? Why was it hard? Have you looked at other solutions? If you haven't, why or why not? 
Why was that solution not perfect? And is this something you'd be willing to pay for? Now, one thing that you should notice in these set of questions is that not one of these questions actually talks about your solution. Okay. If you start to bring your solution into your uh, interviewing of customers, that's going to sort of, you know, move their mind into a very certain direction. It's going to create a lot of bias in any of the feedback that they give you. As a entrepreneur trying to validate a problem, you don't want to talk about your solution just yet. You just want to talk about your problem. You want to start to understand that problem. Okay. Now in the workshop today, we're going to talk about, um, you know, you're going to be allowed to talk about your ideas and that kind of stuff because this is an idea fest. Um, but just when you are working with customers, you want to not talk about your solution. Okay. You want to talk about your problem. You want to understand the problem. Uh, so the second part, right? So now you figured out a problem to solve. Now you have to solve it for one customer. Now, this is a big thing that we see is, is a problem that we call customer confusion. Your customer is the exact person who's going to pay for your product. Now, in some cases, it could be the person that directly influences that payment decision, right? So maybe it's a parent, for example. Obviously, a child's not going to whip out a credit card in most cases to buy uh, your product if, it's, if you're building something for children. Um, but even though that the, the child directly influences that purchase decision, the, the number one person is the person that actually takes out the credit card and pays, okay? So that is the number one person that you should be worried about. And you need to really, really have a focused definition of who they are. I can't tell you how many startups uh, pitch me and I hear, oh, I'm helping women. I'm like really, you're helping like half or whatever, close to half of the population of the world. That tells me that you're pretty lazy in trying to understand who your consumer is and what their problem is, right? You have to be specific. Something like single women aged 22 to 34 in the US to practice yoga and work full time. Similarly, if you're building some kind of small, uh, you know, if you're targeting small businesses with some kind of SaaS product, again, you can't sell a small business, right? It's not the small business who whips out the credit card. It's going to be one specific person in that small business who has their own set of KPIs who has their own set of goals they need to reach to get their next raise, and you have to be solving their problem. So the more defined you can be on the consumer or the customer that you're focused on, the better. And again, you know, being really niche and really focusing on one customer is, is not, I'm not trying to limit your aspirations here. Okay. Uh, Jeff Bezos with Amazon, right? He first focused on people that wanted to buy books that were hard to find in physical stores. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg, they, it was uh, a social, not even a network. It was just a place to see pictures of other people in your dorm, one dorm at Harvard, right? Big businesses are built by focusing on a niche audience first, understanding that audience really well, and then essentially creating a playbook to build out more and more audiences, more and more geographies, et cetera, from there. You have to start niche and you have to understand that audience. The third thing is uh, you have to do this with one product, all right? I hear so many people tell me, oh, I, I'm going to create a whole brand, a whole line of things, right? And it's, believe me, it's hard enough to create one product uh, for one customer that solves a problem they're willing to pay. If you try to do multiple at one time, like at, at least any investor or, or anyone that, that knows what they're doing in startups is just going to sort of roll their eyes at you, all right? And these are some of the rookie phrases that I hear a family of products, suites of products, lifestyle brand, whatever, right? You have to start super focused. And the beauty of it, um, and this is one of the beauties of the internet and all the different tools that we have here, have now, is that you can validate the customer demand for your product before you spend a lot of time um, or money building it. Okay, here's the wrong thing to do is to have your idea in your head. You've thought about what this thing's going to look like years from now. Then you go online, you pay some developers uh, somewhere where developers are cheap to build it. You put it out there and you realize that, uh, you know, you're a solution trying to find a problem, right? Nobody wants your product. Now you're screwed. You're out of money and you're, you're out of a lot of time. The right way to do it is to validate. Now, and at the Founder Institute, this is one of the big things that we do with our, with our companies and with our founders that come through the program. We've had portfolio companies that have achieved amazing things literally before writing one single line of code, right? Not only does that save them time and money and puts them in a position of strength, whether it is to raise funding or hire awesome people before they actually go out and, and you know, 
put their uh, livelihoods on the line, so to speak, to, to build their businesses. So the first method to validate your business is to interview customers. And I, I mentioned this before, and, and this is a uh, part of what the, what the goal of today's event is uh, for you to interview people that could be potential customers. The second method is what is known as the concierge MVP. So for those of you who don't know, an MVP is a minimum viable product. Okay. And this is uh, a first or an early version of a product that you put out there into the marketplace where it's clearly not the final product you're going to build. It's clearly not something that's ever going to be sustainable. The only point of the product is sort of to use a scientific method where you can validate a uh, yes or no, whether, whether people want this product and whether it could become a viable business. So, um, zero cater, which is an interesting company out of Silicon Valley, uh, I really enjoy telling their story because to me, it's, it's just sort of brilliant. Okay. So they essentially had uh, a couple of guys who realized, okay, it's really hard. They, they worked at a small, uh, small uh, company in Silicon Valley and they realized, you know, it's really hard for the office managers at these companies to order lunch for everybody every day. Okay. The office managers have a budget. The office managers get, get, you know, kind of crap when, uh, if they keep ordering the same thing every day and the office managers have a shit ton of other stuff to do, right? It's not, it's not easy being an office manager. So, uh, what they realized was, okay, what if we could figure out a way where they could quickly, uh, and cheaply get a variety of different food to order for their office for lunch every day, right? So literally before building anything, they literally did a spreadsheet. They called restaurants in their immediate area and said, Hey, if we were willing to give you bulk orders, how much of a discount could you give us? Right. Then they started reaching out to office managers. Hey, if we could give you bulk orders uh, on this, is this something that you would subscribe to? Right. So they literally just created a spreadsheet. Then they created a landing page using probably like a $5 tool where people could fill out their information. They manually put it in there and they manually created those matches. All right. And between the difference of the discount that the restaurants were giving them and the discount that they were giving to the, to the uh, business uh, managers, the office managers, they were taking a profit. This is what they did. They were able to do that to hire people and raise money. Again, they're doing this manually. They're sort of like a little hamster wheel in the background of this business. To the consumer, they think that there's some algorithm perfectly matching them, right? But they're really just doing it manually. So again, this is not something that is sustainable over the long term. It's just to prove the business case before they really then quit their jobs and, and went all in to build this business. So this is something that's known as a concierge MVP because on the front end, it looks like, oh, this is, you know, amazing algorithms are doing all this on the back end. It's just a bunch of people on the hamster wheel kind of concierging it out, right? Um, the second thing is the piecemeal MVP. So Sprig is a company who was founded by Gagan Biani, who was uh, also one of the co-founders of, of one of the most successful FI companies, Udemy. And uh, what he did here, it was a company that was essentially trying to get you, uh, you know, freshly cooked, healthy meals within 15 minutes or less, right, in your city. So they focused on San Francisco. What they did was literally to, to test out the, the economics to see if it could work uh, was they, they hired chefs and drivers off Craigslist. They took orders on Eventbrite. Right. So they went on Eventbrite and they created a quote unquote event, right? And instead of a certain type of ticket, oh, you could buy a VIP ticket or you could buy this kind of ticket. Those were actually the dishes that you could order for dinner on a specific night. Um, and then they shared it out through various Facebook groups to all their friends and things like this. And then in order to track and optimize where all the drivers were in San Francisco, they used the settlers of Catan board, literally. Okay. So they pieced all of these things together in one night to see if the model could work. And they proved that it could work. Now, eventually the business failed because a lot of these businesses failed. The, the food delivery space was a really tough one. Um, but the business was around for several years. They raised a ton of money. And it was just a super interesting way that this business was, was able to validate what they were doing without spending really much money at all. Um, as a corollary, a corollary to that, the piecemeal MVP, there are so many no-code products out there right now where you can piece together technologies from a lot of different products to create something that that resembles what you want to build in the future okay um i forgot again who said it but they said you know if, if you don't if the first thing that you release you're not kind of ashamed of or embarrassed by then you're doing it wrong right with all of these tools depending on what type of business you want to build uh you can you can cobble something together that it can at least help you hedge your bet and figure out okay is this actually a business worth building 
Um, and if you want to learn more about some of these no-code things, I, I would recommend nocode.tech. Uh, and then the last way that we see a lot of people kind of start to validate before they build businesses is, is through building an audience first, right? So let's say that you wanted to build an app for runners or something like that. You know what's going to be really helpful when you're building that app for runners is to actually have a community of runners under your control, so to speak. Right. So start a meetup group for runners, start Facebook groups for runners, start a newsletter, start a blog, like start those things now as you're building the business and build those things out. Because over time, number one, uh, that's going to give you an audience to help you validate that business. And number two, that's actually going to give you a built in first customer list. OK, traction trumps everything. You have a first customer list when you're building your business. That's probably the most important thing that you have. So if you have an audience of, of, that you're trying to target with the business, maybe you're not sure exactly what you're trying to do with them yet, start building that audience now before you actually start building a business. It will be an invaluable resource for you. Okay, so I'm going to wrap up here in a second, but the, the fourth rule is one uh, killer feature. All right, There's a common misconception that consumers want choice. And you can see here, this is a screenshot from, I think, Dell, right? Uh, it's probably from a couple of years ago, but it, it's, a bit, uh, it's a bit overwhelming, right? I mean, look, at the, the number of permutations uh, you could do here is, 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 you know, probably in the thousands, tens of thousands of all these different options that they're giving you. Consumers don't want choice. Consumers want freedom of choice, okay? Think about it. Let's say that you're uh, searching for an app on your phone. Uh, to, to schedule a meeting easily or something like that, right? That's one problem that you have. You just want one app that does that really, really well. You're not going to download an app that's an all-in-one schedule, meeting, collaboration, blah, blah, blah platform, right? You want to solve one problem. That's your mindset as a consumer. That's what you're looking for, okay? You want to find that one killer feature because believe me, this is another kind of hack that companies use that eventually will drive them out of business is that they can't find that one killer feature. They just start adding on all types of other features, right? And believe me, having 10 decent features is nowhere near as valuable as having one great feature. Your goal is to find that one killer feature, all right? And if you can find that one killer feature, if you can solve that one problem with one feature, customers will tell you They'll, they'll help you build your product roadmap after that. They'll, they'll help you understand what are the next features that you need to build. There won't be any guessing in place, all right? You just you need to have that match of an audience. One killer feature solves one problem for them that is really important to them. And then after that, they'll, they'll, they'll share your product out. They'll give you feedback. They'll make you understand where your product can go, take all the guesswork out of it. Uh, and then finally, uh, one revenue stream. So. One of the biggest pushbacks we get on this is people will cite, oh, well, Google didn't start with a revenue stream or Snapchat or Twitter or whomever. And that's true, right? But that's also, that argument is like saying, okay, well, you know, Brad, Brad Duke here won the lottery, so I should play the, lot the lottery too, right? Like the lottery is a good strategy to make money, <laughs> right? You don't want to isolate out um, the, the people that essentially won the lottery. All of those businesses rode some of the fastest growth patterns in, in startups that the world has ever seen to get where they were. And they had so much growth quick, so quickly that so many VCs were willing to just throw blank checks at them to take their money, that that's how they were able to grow without a revenue stream. So, um, you know, if you're thinking about a strategy, it's probably best if you assume that you're not going to win the lottery and um, that you're going to have to have some kind of sustainability right off the bat. Now, the other thing that I'll say is not advertising. OK, this kind of pisses a lot of people off, but do some simple math here. Um, a CPM is cost per thousand. This is kind of just how advertising works. Um, a five dollar CPM. I'm, I'm simplifying things a lot here. OK, but a five dollar CPM, which is sort of an average general average, means that for every thousand people you show an ad, you're going to make five thousand dollars. So that means, do the math, you're going to have, have to show an ad to a million people to even make $5,000, all right? That's nothing. That won't even cover your server costs necessarily, right? 
Um, it's certainly not going to cover full-time salaries for a lot of people, for anybody that needs to sell the advertising or anything like that. All right. Advertising in general is not a great revenue stream. Now, again, obviously, if you can become a Facebook level, Twitter level or whatever, then they, they are able to vastly increase their CPM costs because they can target people so well, right? The, the math starts to change. But generally speaking, advertising is not a good way to get started. And, and usually when I see an early stage startup say that they're going to make money on advertising and they don't have a massive amount of traction, it's sort of a laziness on their part. It's, it's, I read it as, okay, you don't have a revenue stream. Right. Um, the other thing about revenue streams is that you don't want to get clever. There are so many other ways, uh, so many other parts of your business where you want to get clever with the revenue stream. You know what the best revenue stream is? I sell you a product, you give me money. Okay. Um, or an extension of that is subscription, where you agree to to do that exchange for many many months over time. Right. That's the best revenue stream. Simple. Uh, you don't have to say, okay, I'm going to provide this value to this customer, then they're going to do this here, and then I'm going to get money on the back end from this person, and then money from this person, right? You don't, don't be like, uh, what's his name here in the hangover and, and try to, you know, piece all these things together. Simplicity is what's important in revenue streams.